I am aware of that, how beloved Diana was by the British public and really throughout mm. the Commonwealth and how she mm-hmm. was revered after death. All that has struck me in, in watching Prince Harry's various interviews and reading the book is, oh my goodness, this is like her revenge on the royal family. Yeah. Because, wow, like he's doing everything I think she wanted to do. Yeah. you twisting. Hey everybody, welcome to the Soberful podcast. So we don't usually have a repeat guest back this quickly, but in January we had um, the just wonderful Dr. Jamie Marich who was here talking about, actually I got it right here, her wonderful book, Disassociation, Disassociation Made Simple, not a simple thing to say. Welcome Jamie. Hi, glad to be back, especially talking about what we're going to talk about. I know. So it's funny. I interviewed Jamie. I got a book. I've started reading it. At the same time, started reading like Half the Planet, Prince Harry's memoir. And the books came out on the same day. They both came out on January oh, 10th. I did funny. a TikTok about that. Yeah. Funny. Yeah. So I um I was reading it, Jamie, and I was reading Prince Harry's biography. And I was like, oh, he was disassociated for most of his young adulthood. Like he was completely dissociated. Yes. And I'm, I, I'm most of the way through the book and there are already about five or six examples I wrote down where he specifically references behaviors that we would describe as dissociation or dissociative. And that's not even including a lot of his drinking and drug references yeah. because, you know, a lot of my teaching is that we can frame addiction as dissociation. So even those aside, there's still a lot of very potent examples where he discusses being dissociated. Yeah. So we were, I think we kind of, uh, both of us commented on on a Facebook post and blah, 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 and realized that we were coming from the same place. And I've been watching a lot of, I mean, you can't avoid it, right? There's so Mm -hmm. much about this uh, memoir and what he's saying and what he's doing. And I'm like, am I in a parallel universe? Because I'm seeing something completely different to what everybody else is seeing. And I feel that we were coming from the same place. And I was like, Jamie, I think I want to talk about this. There's so much here that's relevant. Addiction, mental health, childhood trauma, institutions. Like I was like, who, who, who will talk about this? Jamie. So Jamie (laughs) is back because we wanted, so where do we start? He's speaking out against a major institution, right? Yes, he is. And I'm really proud of him for doing it because Mm. I I, want to say, even if he wasn't Prince Harry, even if he wasn't part of one of the most famous families in the world, if not the most famous family in the world, it is always risky to speak out against your family if said family has dysfunctional or addicted dynamics there's that tendency to be labeled the ungrateful one, the narcissistic one, the bitter one, the resentful one. And so I just want to honor the courage of what he's doing anyway, especially on such a global stage against such an established institution. Yeah. And and I feel like from the get go, we've got to address the whole thing about money. And I finished the book. I know you're, mm-hmm. you've almost finished it. And yes, right. he's got paid, uh, who, we, who knows the amount, but we know it's it's a massive, massive mm-hmm. amount. And I think that that's being used to, well, he's just selling his story to, for, for money. And I think that that's a part of it. But if you read the story right till the end, yeah. um, the big thing that really shook me, and I, I can't understand, and I just feel like so, such insanity on the behalf of the royal family is they pulled all of his security. So right. you're leaving. That's fine. We're not going to pay. And and mm-hmm. to be clear for our American audience, a lot of the monarchy, the British monarchy is funded by British taxpayers. Right. So that, that needs to be understood. So this is someone who was born into a family that has had two armed guards on him. His entire existence mm-hmm. has panic buttons that he's never allowed to leave with ever was um so his whole life was like your prince harry deal with it you got to have security so because this was so intolerable for him they left and they went sorry not going to pay for your security i mean can you I, for me it sounds like uh, well if and that part I, of the I, story cuz i saw that on the netflix documentary yeah. which is another way yeah. he's put his story out there 
yes, was absolutely horrifying to me with the level mm-hmm. of threats mm-hmm. that were lobbied against them. So yeah, if he is selling his story for money, he has every right to do that. Exactly. Yeah. I, I mean, I think she, anybody has credible. a right to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Because now he's in it. Like he was raised he to, needs to, to support be, himself and to be unemployable. <laughs> so, right? right. To be, I mean, he was, uh, I mean, how much it, it, he, they're raised to be professionally gracious. I don't, you know. Oh, great phrase. Right? Monica. <laughs> and, um, Megan, I mean, I, I, I can't even like the misogyny and racism she's experienced. Exactly. She's had credible death threats and you have small children and a pregnant mi- wife. What does anyone think he's going to do? And, mm-hmm. and that security is several million dollars a year. So I, as far as I'm concerned, I'm like, I get it. I get it. And I don't I do you. too. Right. Mm-hmm. But I think that's another example of use anything, even if it's a grasp oh. at straws to go after his character. Mm. because that is also a common thing that gets said. I don't like that word thing. It's a common complaint against anybody who speaks out. I remember at the height of the Me Too movement, a family member who's well-known for protecting institutions said, well, now all these people are just coming out of the woodwork because they want to sell their story for money. And so this is not the first time I've heard this complaint lobbied against people who speak out. Yeah, I, I, I absolutely this was not for money. Yes, he got paid, but I don't, I, I, I believe all of those things mattered. But you, do you know what I was thinking of, Jamie, the other day is when Sinead O'Connor ripped up a picture of the Pope, of the Pope. on SNL oh, yeah. in the 90s and the backlash against her. Sinead mm-hmm. O'Connor was freaking right. And we know that now. Yes. And once more, it's this obsession humankind tends to have with institution. And even though as free citizens, we have a right to speak out against that, we're often not looked at kindly when we do that. Mm. Well, why do you think there is, I mean, I read the British press every day, more Mm -hmm. or less, and (laughs) it's more or less universal. The Guardian is a pretty left-wing leaning paper and they are Mm -hmm. a lot more like, yeah, I mean, he was really traumatized and it's really, but mostly it's universal, like, how dare he? He is so ungrateful. Charles and Camilla are just beacons of respectability and mm-hmm. and, and poor Kate and William. Look how gorgeous she is in her dress. It's like, <laughs> I'm like, what? What the hell? <laughs> well, this is where I think you can give some perspective because I know you and I both share this belief that we as humans seem to have a need at very least a tendency to want to elevate people. Yes. Growing up in Britain, though, and I'm curious about your perspective on what is it about the royal family? Mm. And are they just like an archetype for all these dysfunctional family dynamics? You know, I, I've, so that's a question I ponder a lot, having been raised in the UK, but I live in the States, mm-hmm. is um, there is an innate human need to elevate people and, and, and project and worship on, on them. Mm-hmm. And, and the monarchy provides that for us in, in the UK, in the, in the USA, it's celebrities and politicians, you know, mm-hmm. the whole myth around the Kennedys and Camelot was, right. was raised to this sort of, you know, they, they are otherworldly. They are not like us. Uh, you know, every time a Clinton, a Bush, a Kardashian gets married, <laughs> it's America's royal wedding. And, mm-hmm. you know, I, I sort of think of Kate, you know, Kate Middleton and Princess Diana, before they became royalty, before they even met their future husbands, if you'd have seen them in the grocery store, you probably wouldn't have given them a second glance, right? right? You'd have just been whatever. As soon as that is bestowed on you, it, 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 it our collective perception changes and 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 then we have this you know and and obviously there's the monarchy people are it's hereditary people are bought so by birth there is this specialness and i i just i ordained I'm the, by god yes I've heard that in ordained by several god. programs before yeah it is ordained by god the mm-hmm. monarchy that that is the belief that you know you can see the function of the british monarchy for a long time i find it fascinating mm-hmm. i mean i'm just fascinating with the history of it right but I don't know if it's any more, any longer fit for purpose. And I'm the first to admit, as as an American, I remember the first I learned about the royal family. I was in elementary school in the 80s, and we had our weekly Scholastic Readers, and there was a cover story on it about 
Charles and Diana, and they were holding their children, William and Harry, and talking about how William will be king someday. And the boys are not, I'm just a little bit older than them. So that was part of the fascination that, hey, the, these are fellows who could have been at our school. And it just seemed like, okay, this is something that isn't in the US, but I was immediately intrigued by it. And here as somebody who's rather progressive in my stances on social justice, of course, when Her Majesty the Queen died, I was all about this backlash about the colonial atrocities committed by the British Empire and these raised questions again about is is the monarchy you know, just the most outward symbol of this kind of racist rule of, and, and I'm the first to have those criticisms, but Veronica, I'm also the first to watch like any documentary about the Royal family. I've watched mm. Victoria. I've watched the crown. I've watched obviously Harry and Meghan. Uh, so in my humanity, I'll admit there's something about it. I do find fascinating. It, it provides something for us. Right. And if we don't yeah. have it, something else will fill that gap. Yeah. And is it entertainment or is it that, like we've said, we tend to have this need to put other people on a pedestal? Mm, mm. It's really interesting. Can we go back to the whole, uh, about the institutions? Because that's sure. I know, an area of your your expertise. Mm-hmm. W- why why are people protecting? I mean, he, if you, so oh, I just want to say, first of all, if you've not read the book, more or less everything that's been in the newspapers is really out of context and distorted. I mean, it, the story, the whole thing about, you know, he killed 25, you know, the way he does that mm-hmm. is actually much more sensitive. Oh God, yes. And much more uh, about understanding that uh, about, uh, I mean, I, I really loved his passion for uh, the military and the people in service and how much he wants to serve them. And and uh, I think he said it on an uh, interview uh, that was about being honest about that to prevent suicides. About that mm-hmm. we we need to talk about that because it's a it it's one of the roots of suicides. What why why are we protecting this institution? Why are we not seeing what's there? A lot of my frame of reference to it is not so much monarchy, but the church, especially the Catholic Church, mm-hmm. 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 with the work that I do with spiritual abuse and. I've I've cried out the same questions with why are we protecting priests and cardinals and the yeah. patriarchy within the church, especially when wrongdoings exposed. And the short answer I've come to is so many people wonder who would I be without it. Mm. That's my short answer to it. And so much of that goes back to do we look and we, we see these dynamics in alcoholism and addiction all the time. Mm-hmm. Do we look to something outside of ourself? Mm. We need to, we need something to believe in. Yeah, yeah. I think you're right. I think I think that that's what is provided by the royal family is is we need to we need to believe in them as a standard as a something to admire. But I think I think that's what the book reveals is they're just a dysfunctional family, just like anyone else, but with this exceptionally toxic relationship on with the press and and that was the big thing and that's what he really wanted to expose and and again I I ask you know if you're British we we all I think everybody remembers when Princess Diana died oh it was formational to my life too I was uh I just graduated high school right and I remember I was up all night watching the news when it happened and got up to the funeral and yeah 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 and um at that time Camilla was public enemy number one. She of was course, hated, yeah. hated. Diana was beloved. Even before she died, she was beloved. After she died, she was um, sanctified. Mm-hmm. And so, oh, finish that thought. Then I so, want to talk about so Diana. It's take, so it's taken 25 years. Mm-hmm. Camilla is now seen as a national treasure. Right. And and what that book revealed, it was all through media manipulation. It was mm-hmm. all through... And, and again, I, I up until reading that book, I would have told you, well, I think the boys accepted her. He, she made her dad happy and, you know, mm-hmm. they were happy. Their dad was happy. I also would have told you I thought the boys were really, really close. And, and it doesn't seem that either of those things are true. That was all appearances. That right. they weren't, that, that they, it doesn't seem like they have any kind of close relationship with Camilla whatsoever. Um, and the, the, and again, this drives me crazy. The, 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 uh, I'm, I have two sons. It breaks my mm-hmm. heart. But it the ins the way the institution set them up as the heir and the spare, just created conflict. How, how Correct, could they yeah. be the close? 
brotherly bond that every parent wants for their child, the institution and the way it's designed created them to be at odds with each other, mm-hmm. which is a ter- which is a terrible tragedy. What were you going to say about Diana? So, yes, I I have aware of that, how beloved Diana was by the British public and really throughout mm-hmm. the Commonwealth and how she mm-hmm. was revered after death. And all that has struck me in, in watching Prince Harry's various interviews and reading the book is, oh my goodness, this is like her revenge on the royal family. Yeah. Because, wow, like he's doing everything I think she wanted to do. Yeah. But it's striking, like, I'm wondering how is, like, is Diana still in that position of reverence with the British public? Or has that largely been forgotten because of Uh, No, I think, uh, yeah, yeah. no, I think, I, 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 again, Charles is now king, Camilla is the queen consort. Right. Again, that's a play on words. It's the whole thing about that Mm -hmm. she's divorced, they're both divorced, they have to be the head of the church, I I don't know, whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, So... Diana is still so th- that's the other thing is the boys were very very beloved and right. um you know reading that book again the, losing your mother at that age in an accident she was so oh. young was was horrible what traumatized them is yes. what the institution did other afterwards and i remember Jamie i was not sober and i was not a mother i was not a trained therapist mm. but i remember watching that funeral thinking that can't be right How, what who made a 12 year old boy walk behind his mother's coffin in front of i think he said there was 3 million people in london mm-hmm. for the funeral i was going to go by the way it's hungover didn't watch mm. it on telly anyway that's an aside and i remember thinking this this can't this can't be right. And, and I think, you know, that, and they were pra- paraded out. Um, mm-hmm. And to praised com- for their composure. Yeah. And, and, and he talks about that. He didn't cry, that crying. <sighs> right. And nobody, he didn't cry and nobody hugged him. That's right. freaking child abuse. And, and spoiler alert for those of you who haven't read the book yet. One of the most compelling narrative threads in this is how he framed her death as a disappearance. Yes. Which is the through, disassociation, right? Yeah. I mean, it very much could be, you know, a way, way to cope with it. Cause his, his, his immediate thought being, you know, she couldn't really have died. She staged a disappearance so she can get yeah. away from all of this. And yeah, through much of the book, he referred to her death as a disappearance because that's yeah. how his young mind was able to, to cope with it. So yeah, I mean, that, that certainly, can be framed as a dissociative response. Yeah, I mean- It's it, heartbreaking, heartbreaking. And even as I was listening, as I've been li- re- listening on, on audiobook, uh, wow. And, and, and this is the thing I really want to impart as a therapist. You know, and I'm sure he had help writing the book. I'm sure he's had prep for all these interviews. Yet I find that he carries himself with such a candor mm. and such an emotional intelligence that evidences to me this person has done his work. Yes. Yeah. And we know from the Oprah Winfrey special, the me you don't see that he has done his work. He has sought therapy. He has Mm -hmm. sought healing in the book. He's very open about his PTSD and trauma. Mm -hmm. And yeah. And, and I know when a survivor does this, their, their integrity will be torn to shreds Mm -hmm. in the public press yet as a therapist. Wow. I'm on his side. (laughs) That's all I got to say. Same here. And that's why we wanted to do this because I I was Mm -hmm. the same. I'm like, oh my God, yes, you're speaking your truth. And, and, you know, anyone who's British, we saw this. It's not like, Mm -hmm. I mean, some of it, I was surprised that they weren't as close as what was kind of, uh, we were led to believe. And I'm surprised that they don't seem to be close to Camilla and that was all media manipulation. But really we saw all of that. And I agree. I, I believe Diana is somewhere cheering him on absolutely mm-hmm. because it that system crushed her i mean she was so young and and so unsupported it was really awful um but yeah i felt the same i i feel i feel this is a person standing in their truth with no more fucks to give precisely and i think the bigger conversation and why i was grateful for you to host this conversation on soberful is can we all be inspired by that yeah. I am. I yeah. really am. 
Yeah, and, and I'm, I'm, you know, I'm even wondering, Jamie, what kind of pushback we'll, I'll get from this episode because, you know, I've seen lots. So, you know, just oh, I'm sure all that spoil. Who does he think he is? Just, you know, everything. And and I, 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 you know, there was it, it's so much in our remit. You know, the substance abuse, which I'm going to have to say does concern me, and it does seem that his, I don't know. It's, I bet it's probably calmed down because he has children, but I want to say, Harry, if you're listening, <laughs> substances mm-hmm. are not the answer. Um, I want to talk a little bit about Megan. Yes. Because I love her. I love her. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I um, So as a therapist, um, so one of the things that, that came out, um, you know, when she, she it was it began to be clear how unhappy she was and da da da, um, she's a bully. There's bullying accusation, serious bullying. She's a bully. And I don't buy that for a second. And the reason I don't buy that is there's no pattern. So, and so yeah. And so this goes to, because this was my reaction immediately. Like, is she a quote unquote bully or is she standing up for herself? Yeah. Because a trend that I see happening on social media, in public discourse anyway, is like the word narcissist. And I've heard that used to describe Megan as well. And, and, and yeah. My disclaimer here is I don't know what goes on on the inside, but this yeah. is my commentate commentating based on knowing trauma dynamics. And even though I'm glad there's more awareness around narcissistic abuse and the term narcissist, I see the word getting misused a lot to reference people who are really just standing up for themselves, being assertive, standing up in their boundaries. Mm-hmm. And this is where I've I've talked with a good Irish friend of mine about this. I can see where a strong American woman doing that would especially be offensive to British sensibilities. Yeah, I I, I felt the same. She, she's very, she reminds me a lot of my daughter-in-law, you know, mm-hmm. well-educated, uh, has an opinion, smart, mm-hmm. assertive, good at networking, mm-hmm. um, you know, and, and I can, you know, Kate Middleton, I'm sure she's a lovely person. I'm sure she's a great mum. But Kate went to school and then worked part-time in her parents' business as she waited to be proposed to. I mean, that's her choice, fine. Mm-hmm. I love the fact that Megan, ha- you know, she grew up in, she grew up like I did. I grew up as a single, as an only child in a single parent on mm-hmm. not the, you know, as in an okay neighborhood. She She's hustled, you know, she, everything that she mm-hmm. did, she did, she had a, a career, she, she, and also the other thing that I find really annoying, I thought that her um, service work was quite substantial and sincere long before she met Harry. Like of that course, was yeah. really, she, it wasn't like, uh, she, it, it was a real passion of hers. And again, that just how she's, the misogyny, every single woman that joins the war, war, royal family goes through this. And, and William and Charles seem to have this kind of like, mentality will you know Camilla and Diana and Kate went through this it's just how it is you just got don't don't comment Mm -hmm. and Harry was saying no no there's a race element to this there's racism to this so all the women go through this horrifying that they're sort of I remember Fergie went through the same thing she was it's like a hazing yeah 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 but then it doesn't end Mm-hmm. And and you you and they cast them. So Diana's always been beloved and the saint. Um, Fergie very quickly was a breath of fresh mm-hmm. air. Then she was a fat pig. Right. Um, and and you know, there's Prince Andrew's daughters have both married, and and the men that they've been married to, you know, not a whole lot. There was nothing. You know, you, mm-hmm. men can marry into the royal family. There's right. not a whole lot. Women, but I, I don't think any of them went through what what Megan went through and i i sincerely believe she deeply loves him i think she she went in gung ho mm-hmm. to do her best to to learn everything and and it's almost like yeah the the the, the accusations that have been thrown at her i i i can believe that how you know she felt suicidal sure i re- well, and i remember when i first cuz i had not heard of Meghan markle personally before she started dating prince harry but yeah, then i read nobody had it was about was her a, background yeah. and you know that she was on the show but it was very intrigued by her and i remember even saying to my brother who's a total anglophile and monarchist <laughs> he's also a priest so you could draw that conclusion how you will uh i said what 
Prince Harry's dating a divorced biracial American? Like, I don't see how that's going to go over well. That was just my gut level reaction, knowing what I know about Britain and the monarchy. And yeah, I think everything I figured would happen would happen. Hmm. And I think the Netflix documentary did a really good job of comparing headlines of how she was treated versus how Kate was treated. And, you know, good on Prince Harry for calling that out immediately. Yes. Yeah. Well done for him. Uh, You know, I'm sure she's not perfect. Nobody is. I'm sure she has her faults. Mm -hmm. Uh, I'm sure maybe, you know, we all unintentionally perhaps hurt someone's feelings. We've all done that. But the way that she has been monstered, I'm I'm almost feel embarrassed. I feel embarrassed of um, my country for doing mm-hmm. that to her. I almost want to personally apologize that she was mm-hmm. treated so horribly. Um, as a trauma therapist, what was your what was your take on his trauma in in the book? Like, what were you thinking when you were reading that? <sighs> that this is so like what other people I've worked with over the years have reported and shared. I mean, that's why it's totally credible to me because it it matches the patterns that we see in war trauma survivors, in survivors of children who have lost a parent, especially have lost a parent tragically, in children, who, and even take Diana's death away. I mean, you have, you know, these boys were already born into a mess of a family. And how often does this happen where like your parents get married kind of against their will? I mean, I think Diana wanted it, but we knew Charles loved someone else. And so the, I think there was an unhappy home anyway. And so many of our, our folks deal with that. And so yeah, it's completely credible to me because his stories and how he tells them totally parallel what I've seen in my practice over the years. Added to the trauma of being such a public figure. Yeah. And I remember from the Oprah Winfrey special, uh, The Me You Can't See, which is a you know fabulous docuseries on mental mm. health. Mm. Him... Oprah asked him the question, it seemed like the rest of the world was given a chance to process your mother's death and you weren't. And he said, without question. So I feel for Harry, I feel for William, because I think Mm -hmm. William's been through it too. Yeah. I think his chosen method of coping has been embrace his destiny, do your duty. That's what a lot of survivors of trauma do as well. Really? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So- Something that I learned in the field about Vietnam veterans, especially, Mm -hmm. and we actually have a qualifier now in the DSM under PTSD with delayed expression. Okay. What that means is the symptoms of the PTSD may not show up for six months to a year to years later. Mm -hmm. And the phenomenon that we saw happen with Korea and Vietnam veterans, especially, is I came home from war. I decided to just do my duty and push it all aside got married. Yes, some vets took it differently and were affected differently, but a lot of other veterans did kind of what William's doing. Let's shove it down, cope, get to work. Right. And it's often when a veteran retires or when their spouse dies that a lot of the old trauma symptoms that they had buried down come back up Mm. because that's often what they did it for, was for Mm. their family, was Mm. to keep working. And then when those things fall away, you're left with yourself. Yeah, it's it's really interesting. William has embraced his destiny. You know, just I was thinking when I was reading it, people, children become what you tell them they are. And if you, mm-hmm. they were told, right, you know, you are the heir, you will be king. I can't, mm-hmm. I can't actually imagine yeah. what that would do to a child. And you are the spare. <laughs> Which is why the title of that book is so brilliant. I, mm. I adore as a writer one word titles that just say mm. it all. Mm. Mm. And yeah, as soon as I saw it was titled that, it was like, that's so on point. You know, it, before I read all of this, if someone asked me about the monarchy, I would I would always say um, I wasn't anti-monarchy and I wasn't pro-monarchy. I was an acceptor mm. of their place in our culture and the need for that we have to elevate people. So I was more, ex- I was accepting of them. I wasn't pro or against. I will now say I'm still not against, I'm not anti monarchy, but I believe now that it should complete itself with William. And the reason yeah. for that, as a British citizen, now knowing what I know, 
uh, honestly, okay, so let me just say, I'm more concerned about little children in England who right now don't have enough heat and enough food and all of that kind of stuff. However, when I see Prince George's little face, his face looks stressed to me. His Mm. little face when they are going to school and there's a battery of cameras and I I just, he looks stressed to me. And I now feel to support this, I'm participating in his abuse and trauma and that I can't, I can no longer support this institution because mm-hmm. I would be supporting the traumatization of small children who are told you're going to be the king, et cetera. Mm-hmm. And that might sound crazy to some people. So I think that it, the British monarchy could complete itself with William and there could be some kind of transitional state. Mm-hmm. Who knows? I don't know. It's, it's, mm-hmm. I mean, we couldn't for a long time even imagine not having the queen and now we don't have the queen. So I don't know. I mean, the Catholic Church has, uh, has it, I mean, it's still there, right? I mean. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's not going away. So probably the monarchy is not going away either. Nor nor do I think I would want the Catholic Church to go away. I want to be clear Mm -hmm. about that. Yet what I think both the Catholic Church and the monarchy can do is embrace radical reform, rebrand, if you will. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a really good point that Prince Harry made in the Netflix documentary They really missed the boat here by rejecting my wife, because as a person of color who looks like most of the quote unquote Commonwealth, yeah, Yeah. could have been an amazing um, ambassador. And I think that was their opportunity, right right there, right. And I think the monarchy can admit historically where they've been wrong and make atonement and make reparations. Are they going to do that? No. Do I see the the yeah. uh, Catholic church doing that in any substantial way? No, because I think abusive systems, it's giving away your power when you admit that you're wrong. Yeah. So, and I think, and to be fair, I think some members of the monarchy have done that in small, albeit token ways <laughs> yet. I mean, what I'm talking here is like radical reform, like tear this down and build up something new. Yeah, I I would love to see that. I would love to see a real meaningful um, outreach to, on behalf of the empire, to apologize to Mm -hmm. the people, to have some financial uh, amends. Preparations. Yeah, Mm -hmm. and some returning of things that were taken. Um, I, I think that that could be transformational for the country for the institution and for the world if that was done and it's like you know keep a hundred million <laughs> you know don't keep your security you know go open parliament do do those things but gosh wouldn't that be something but i no, I, I don't i don't know if that's ever gonna happen the world needs to work a 10th step right <laughs> <laughs> um, i wanted to say um the other thing about this whole kind of saga, uh, Diana and Charles were married in 1980 when she was 19 mm-hmm. years old. She was barely out of adulthood. Mm-hmm. And at the time, the monarchy required the future king to marry a suitable virgin. Mm-hmm. And that ship had sailed with Camilla, I'm, I'm guessing. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Diana was of suitable virginity. And and yeah. they met maybe 20 times Mm-hmm. And it was, you know, deemed that she could be shaped into a suitable companion mm. for the king. That she shaped. would, yes, yeah, she would, she would, she looks the part. She can fit the part, and and so the the sort of institutional, you know, it, it, it the institute created this problem. Yet Harry and Meghan are being blamed for it. But that's where it started because I don't think any of us believe. I, I think she went into it very you know as a naive Mm -hmm. 19 year old girl as you would like wow very quickly realized that this he didn't she didn't love her wasn't Mm -hmm. in love with her and you know by 23 24 her all her dreams were just were dashed and and she then had to survive in this institution on her own with everybody you know the whole family were and I won't say against her but nobody was supporting her Mm -hmm. and that's how all of this survived is that is that abuse and trauma that then just set this up. And and then they all kind of colluded in this narrative of the heir and the spare. 
And they, it's really interesting to me how so, they created mm-hmm. it, but they're not taking responsibility for that. Right. And what you're saying is they set this up. And that is a mm-hmm. dynamic that is not unique to the royal family. It is unique to the way trauma runs through families intergenerationally. Yeah. Some of the deepest work I've had to do in my own healing mm-hmm. is to really unpack what my great-grandfather went through in Croatia and Serbia before coming to the U.S. We're all the living legacies of the generations mm-hmm. that came before us. Mm. Can you say a little bit more about that? Yeah. I mean, how do you do that? Yeah, I think we often think of the home in which we're raised as the thing that creates this, but it goes back because if you think of the issues you had with your parents or your guardians, there were people who created those issues in them and people who created those issues in them. Mm. And like just for example, on on my great grandfather's side of the family. So my last name, Marich in English, or we say Matic in Croatian, that wasn't even our ancestral last name. It was Matic. And it was changed in the U.S., and which was a common thing for, for names to be changed when people came to the U.S. But he had the name in the U.S. for quite some time. And from what I've learned talking to friends about the region he was from and how violent it was and how it's always been in the Croatia-Serbia crosshair, somebody said, I bet he changed his name to just avoid old world trouble and to sound more Croatian because he married Mm -hmm. a Croatian woman. So it dawned on me at that point when I was doing some of this family history digging, my whole last name is a protective response. Mm. My, My whole last name is potentially a facade so he could blend in more with Croatian folks. Yeah. So I I think even just considering these things, it's like, man, what was, what was he carrying? Cause yeah, like on my dad's side of the family, we've heard the stories about how, how much of a temper their father had and that that comes from somewhere. And then when I think of my great grandfather coming from the part of Croatia and Serbia that he did, Of course, that gets carried down to your descendants, being exposed Mm -hmm. to war, being exposed to geopolitical violence that I think many of us bear the legacies of in our families. Mm -hmm. And I will further say, for people who are still listening and don't think Veronica and I are just a bunch of feminist loons, uh, if this area of intergenerational trauma interests you, what I think is required reading is a book called My Grandmother's Hands by Resma Menikam. And he is a uh, clinical social worker, somatic practitioner, cultural somatics. And in his book, he just makes such a brilliant case for, yes, when we talk about eradicating the impact of racism, eradicating all these things that we as progressive people know we need to do, he says white people have to do their own work. Mm. about their own family legacies to really look at how have what we've been raised in, how has what we've been raised in made it easier for us to pick on other people, especially people who look different than us. So my grandmother's hands, if you've not read it, please, please, please read it. Oh, that sounds fascinating. I'll I'll order that immediately. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's really interesting what you say, because, um, what is what he talked about in the book is is very 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 British, and it is it's passed down through generations, and it's not talking about your feelings. Mm-hmm. Like is is this? Oh, that's British, the stereotype of the British way. Yes. Well, they're still doing it. They're right. still the stiff upper lip, which you know. I, I think that so much of this can be traced back to the Great War, the First World War, right. which which was so horrifyingly brutal and traumatic for so many young men who came back and were not allowed to express the the emotion or talk about it, that Mm -hmm. they went on to become parents. And and that was how I was raised in my family. Any emotion beyond, um, oh, that's a little upsetting, or, oh, well done, anything beyond that range was shut down immediately. Mm -hmm. It just wasn't acceptable. You know, I was told things like, don't upset yourself which mm-hmm. was code for, I can't handle how you feel, so you need to stop yes. it. Yes. Wow. Um, yeah. And and I felt like I had this, um, I, I just felt like this balloon was expanding in me, that I, I had all these feelings that I had no idea what to do or anything, <sighs> and, um, and, to, and which is why I drank and used drugs, which is what Harry did, because you mm-hmm. just don't. 
and I, I cannot get over, I, I just can't. There is this 12 year old little boy who's just lost his beloved mother and no one mm -hmm. in his family hugs him. Like, I just can't get over that we're admiring these people. Like I, I, you know, Kate is Kate Middleton. I keep she's the Princess of Wales now. Right, right, right. Um, she's doing a lot around early childhood stuff, and I have no doubt she's a great mom who's really invested in her kids and and has read all the books and is really you know trying to do the best she can under challenging circumstances. But William and Harry, like he, there was one bit I don't know if you've got to it yet. Is towards the end something he does something I can't remember what it is now. And his brother and dad kind of give him a sort of sort of a little hug, and he's so like taken mm -hmm. aback by like this extreme display of emotion by right. them. And I'm like, I inhale my children, like mm. like I am, um, like I nuzzle them <laughs> like they're ponies. <poos. Yeah. laughs> and, and I'm just like, I, I that that's the generational British stuff that right. is was displayed mm -hmm. by the aristocracy and kind of filtered down to all of mm -hmm. the different classes. And we're still a very class-based society. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's so dysfunctional. And he just lays out how harmful that is. And it's harmful to all of us. And I remember, this is so Britain's reputation in the world. Yeah. That the first time I went to teach as a trauma therapist in the UK in 2016, because I've invited been invited several times now to the UK and... I was filled with this fear about, oh my gosh, how are British people going to take me? Not only as somebody who's pretty quintessentially American, although I have a lot of European sensibilities. And and what I have found though, Veronica, and I think this is the good news is I, I love teaching in the UK. I love my therapist friends I've met in the UK. I have been received very well teaching mm -hmm. courses in the UK because I think there's this sense of... Oh, she sees us. She recognizes what a problem this is and that we as therapists are dealing with the aftermath of this, the impact of this. And yeah. so, so many British therapists I've met are just amazing and are aware of this reality and willing to help people as they're able yeah, I, I still think America leads the world, but I, I, it, England isn't bad. I mean, I practiced there for years and I think there's a much more open. And, and also, I, I do think William and Harry and Kate, they, I mean, they were involved in, I don't know if it's still, they, they had a charity about right. mental health. And they mm -hmm. they were, I mean, he before even he met Megan, I think he was beginning to talk about it. Oh, for it. sure. And, it, mm -hmm. and, and that helped enormously uh, uh, for people to, to hear that. And I... Um, yeah, and what he's doing now. So uh, final thoughts as we wrap this up. You know, I just want to say one thing when I read the book about, and I, and the show about her dad. I don't know if you thought this as well. For me, I I think it was really ter tragic and terrible what happened with her dad because she lost a parent as well, is I think he was so scared. I think, I think going and being the father of a bride can be intimidating for a lot of men. Mm -hmm. And then in, at that level, I think he self subconsciously self sabotaged himself because the whole idea was completely overwhelming and terrifying that's my take on it i will say i have no real opinion really on, you know her her dad's threat other than i i think tyler perry actually who's their friend uh made a really good comment about it that i tend to agree with in the netflix documentary that yeah when you get a higher level of fame and notoriety people even people who you thought were close to you will start doing weird things start mm -hmm. acting weird, maybe even start coming out of the woodwork, wanting more from you. Mm. So with, with both Megan's father and her half sister, I think we're dealing with some of those dynamics that are pretty common. Yeah. Um, what uh, final thoughts, what, what do you think is going to happen? Um, do you think it's going to change? Do you think, I mean, I, I just, I want them just to be happy and I'd love to, I'd love to see Harry, really involved in uh, charity work around veterans. I think that's clearly right. his passion. Well, I, I, I go to a joke from the American series Family Guy. They were commenting on Downton Abbey, which is a series that <laughs> yeah, probably yeah. a lot of us know and love. And yeah. they're like, you know, what's it about? And he said, it's about a wealthy British family dealing poorly with gradual change. <laughs> That just, oh yes. Oh my god! That's I mean, it. 
does that not describe Downton Abbey for those of you who, who've seen the series? And when I when I look at the royal family, even over the course of my lifetime, have I seen gradual change? Yeah, I could I could say that steps in the right direction. Yet, is it going to be the kind of level of radical change that's needed to make any impact in our lifetime? No, I don't see that happening at all. Yet, I do think what Harry can do is he's doing what what I try to do in a small way in my profession, which is use his privilege to speak out. Yeah. And to try to use his influence for good. Yeah. Because the thing I've, I've learned about power and privilege is it's not a bad thing to have it. It's how are you using it? Yes. And yeah. so I think we'll see. I'm curious to see how his and Megan's journey unfolds now that he's yeah. really let it all out of the bag. Yeah. The same. I, I, uh, I wish them well. I really want them. They, they seem very in love and, and they're both children of divorced families and, and mm -hmm. children of divorced families. I think they are passionate about creating a family for their children. And I think that there's lots of good that they can do in the world. And I think they're incredibly brave. I think he's really brave. And I just, I'm so, I feel so bad how Megan was treated. It was, I mean, just recently there was a journalist, J Jeremy Clarkson, who wrote the most appalling piece in a newspaper that he he fantasizes about her being shamed and walking naked in public and people pr throwing excrement at her. He was at a lunch with Camilla days earlier. Wow. That's such a horrifying betrayal. I mean, if anyone spoke about my daughter-in-law like that, I'd kill them. I, I just, it's a horrifying betrayal. And, and I even just as feel, you, yeah, And even as you say that, I'm disgusted and sadly not surprised. And nobody spoke out. Nobody spoke out. Nobody said that. Nobody said that was not okay. Um, I, I was reading, uh, William pushed back and tried to sue a newspaper because someone implied that Kate had had Botox. Mm. Mm -hmm. But nobody said anything. And and that, it's it's that. So um, I, I will see. I mean, it's been interesting, you know, following from Diana to where we are now to where we'll be in 40, 50 years, I, I wonder. But I, I wish them well. And I, I think that he was really brave and what he did was incredible. And I applaud it. And I'm really glad we got to speak about it. Thanks for having me on. I think this is an important conversation to have. And I hope that more people will continue to have it. Yeah. Thank you so much, Dr. Jamie. You can find, where can people find it? You need to follow her on TikTok. I, I've been watching her TikTok ah, videos. Yes. Brilliant. <laughs> TikTok is at Trauma Therapist Rants. I actually did a couple on Prince Harry on TikTok. And, I saw uh, them. Yeah. You know, he drove his grandmother to an early grave and <laughs> the things that people get hurled against them. Easiest uh, for the book is www.redefinetherapy.com and that'll link you to all my other material too. Brilliant. Thanks, Dr. Jamie. And I'll see you Cheers. soon. Cheers. Thanks, care. Veronica.